Praise the Lord. I appreciate the Lord's presence. The thoughts that I've had this morning, I've almost in the natural, I would have said, well, Lord, here we go again. Same old, same old. But I don't believe that's the case. I believe the Lord has exactly, you know, what, what's on his heart is what he knows we need. And uh, certainly there's been a lot of confirmation with the songs that we've sung this morning. And I guess if I had to characterize the thought that came to me the other day, and I haven't been able to shake it, so I'm just going to go with it, uh, is very simply this, when faith is all you have. You know, a lot of times the gospel is preached in such a way that it's almost like come to Jesus and your life will be filled with joy and happiness and peace and, you know, it's just going to be like on sunshine and roses the whole way. And yet those of us who've come to the Lord and, and walked with him any length of time know it's not that way. Thank God there are times like that when we do experience his joy in this world. But the reality is there are many, many times in the life of God's children when he calls upon us to walk by faith. And truly what Paul says, we walk by faith and not by sight, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. That's the principle. That's the governing principle of the Christian life. It's not a confidence. It's where we throw off all confidence in ourselves. I can't make myself righteous. I can't fix what's wrong with me. I cast myself completely upon him. My hope is, is transferred from anything in me to him. And that's, that's faith, and only God gives the ability to do that. But the reality is, more than we would like to admit, we lean on other things. We want confirmation, don't we? Do I really have faith? What's, you know, and, and so we're, we're, all, we're all the time looking for God to pat us on the back and, and put his arm around us and, and say, it's going to be okay, and, and you know, I'm really here. I, I didn't lie to you when I said I was going to be with you. Uh, you know, but psychologically, we lean on those things. And God, you know, it's just, like I say, it's not that way. I remember, some of you will remember many times, a number of times, Brother Thomas telling the story, and I honestly don't know if this was a dream vision or somebody made up the story to illustrate this, but as I recall the story, some of you can correct me if I'm wrong, there was a man who was observing a scene in which three people were on their knees uh, praying. And Jesus came up behind the first one and leaned down and just got down on his knees beside him, put his arm around him, was just constantly whispering in his ear and just, just really spending a lot of time, giving him a lot of attention. And so finally that ended and Jesus got up and he went to the second one just laid his hand on his shoulder and went on. The third one, he just walked right on by. And of course, in the estimation of the observer of this scene, boy, he thought the first one was that, that was the guy that really had the goods. This is the one who's really got some standing with God. The Lord is pleased with him. He's just strong and a wonderful. And, and it, was, it was just the other way around. The one who needed this continual reassurance in some fashion was the one who was weak in their faith. And the one who didn't need Jesus to, to do anything to be able to stand fast and be who he you know, was meant to be and to, stand, to constantly can, you know, put his faith in God, that was the one Jesus didn't even have to give him that assurance. And, uh, you know, the, the Scripture says that we, Scripture we've used many times, without faith, impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if God is going to work in his children, he is going to have to work in a way that, build, that brings us to a place where we truly are living by faith and not by something else. I mean, you can, you can live by tradition, you can live by rules, you can live by self-effort and, and, there's, and there's a lot of things, emotional feedback, and, uh, you know, God is, if God's going to grow us up in him, he's going to have to take us beyond that. But, I mean, we, we have but to look at the Scriptures to know that some of God's choicest saints, I say some, how about all, of God's champions of the faith, every single one of them was put in many places where they didn't have anything to go on. Every natural consideration was taken away. Now, it isn't always that way where it's so dire uh, Robert, not, it's not about you, but it, where, where the situation is not so extreme where there's nothing. I mean, I, I've 
personally think of situations where my health was okay, the bills were paid, and it's still something that was really causing me to have to wait a minute. I don't have any feedback here. I don't, my feelings are dead. If I pray, it just doesn't feel like anything's going beyond the, beyond the ceiling. I just, uh, you know, I, I come and I go through the motions and it just doesn't, where is God in all of this? What's going on? I mean, I know this, I, I see a lot of head shaking. I know you know what I'm talking about. And it's not that, oh God, I'm about to declare bankruptcy and my health, you know, I'm dying. It, it's not, it could be in any area of our life, but I'll tell you, we serve a God who knows the path that we take. Like, he, like Job said, he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. But, you know, I thought about a scripture that we use many times. And I'll refer to, well, let's go ahead and read this one in Psalm 13. This isn't, wasn't exactly the text I had in mind, but I didn't have a particular text anyway, so that'll, that'll, this will work. Uh, but I'll just use the first part of it right now. But this is David. This is a man after God's own heart. This is somebody God singled out and said, you are my king. I have anointed you, and I am with you, and you are going to rule my people Israel. Okay, he's a young man at this point, probably late teens, I'm guessing. I don't know the exact chronology of this, but he was not a boy. <laughs> he, was still, he was a young man. But he was 30 years old when he came to the throne, and then he had a lot of battles. So, you know, between the call and the, the position that God had for him, there was a lot he had to go through. And one would suppose, by the way, some people preach it, that it's just get, you get on Sunshine Mountain and then you just climb and it just gets better and better and more and more exhilarating. And a lot of people's religion consists of trying to work up emotions. That is, it's at least a big part of it. As long as I can work up an emotion and feel good, then I'm good. If, I, if my emotions collapse, then, oh God, where is God? As though that's the measure. How do we, you know, we have our own ways of measuring our standing before God, and it just doesn't, it doesn't work. And if that's the case, if that's the situation we're in, God is going to put us in a place where that ain't going to work. And he's just going to stay back. And that's what happened here. When David, the God's, a man after God's own heart said, how long, O Lord? How long? Will you forget me forever? Now, did the Lord forget him? But David sure felt like that, didn't he? As far as he was concerned, he was abandoned. Something is wrong. God has gone and left me, and I am in a dire situation, and, and I just can't, I, I don't, I can't cope. And I, when I pray about it, he doesn't hear me. What's going on? I don't know. Nobody here has ever experienced that, right? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have every day have sorrow in my heart? You know, we don't have a push button religion. God absolutely doesn't give us formulas for feeling good. Oh, we would like them. That's the natural man wants to feel comfort in in circumstances and emotions and, and all of those kinds of things. We want, to, we want to have a sense of earthly well-being. And here's God setting out to rescue us from a nature that is, a, that is absolutely addicted to that. It's addicted to it, folks. You and I are addicted to feeling good and wanting feedback. How is God going to deal with that? And how is he going to grow us up and get us to the point where we walk by faith and not by sight if he doesn't put us in places where we have nothing that we can get up, grab a hold of? And now, we're, now it's nothing. Faith is all we have. Is that a bad thing? Of course not. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? I mean, that's the sense that he had. I'm running for my life here. It looks like I've lost the battle. I'm not just losing. I've lost the battle. Oh, God, and I, you won't answer me. I don't get this. I don't understand it. And so David's just pouring out his heart. Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Thank God the rest of this it really goes into the answer to this. It shows where David really was. 
And I'm not going to I'm not going to deal with that right now. But the, this is this is just one of many illustrations in the scriptures that shows that this is not this is not unusual. If you're in a place like that, God doesn't want you to look and say, "What's going on? I don't get this." God's singling me out. Because when we are in that place, of course we question, of course we wonder, of course we say, "Oh God, is there a need?" Well, there's nothing wrong with asking Him. But it's like I've said in the past, sometimes we get the feeling that God is so mad at me, he will not even tell me what's wrong. You know, we come up with all kinds of, of crazy ideas in the face of these kinds of situations. It tends to bring out a lot that's in us, doesn't it? And so one of the dangers at, at these times is the devil will do everything in his power to sow something of his wisdom in our hearts, our soil, our, our hearts is like soil, remember? That's how we got, came to the Lord in the first place. He sowed the seed of his word, word that had life in it. And we open our hearts to that, invite him to come in and do the work that he has promised. And that, that seed grows into something, into eternal life is what it grows into. But I'll tell you, the devil can plant all kinds of weeds in our lives if we're not careful. And, uh, you know, Weeds of bitterness. My circumstances, God's, you know, God's not being fair. And how easy it is to project onto God when, when we're not doing good. And something is, he's, not being, he's not doing things quite right. You know, Job kind of went through that. In a way, that, he, he was so, anyway, I, I won't, I'll just summarize what, what he went through. But the devil challenged God about Job, and, and so the Lord allowed Job to experience what he did, the terrible loss of his family, his possessions, and uh, he had no help from anybody around him. His wife said, curse God and die, you're a fool. And his friends got their theology books out. They gave out the theological tradition in which they had been raised. Now, this was in the post-flood era, and so all they knew is God blesses the righteous and he punishes the wicked. We know it. We had that terrible flood. All of our, so many of our ancestors, they're gone because God judges the wicked. So if you have suffered adversity and catastrophe, there is only one possible explanation. You have committed a wickedness and God is punishing you. And they went on and on and on and on and on. And nothing could dissuade them from that, from that position. But you know, we, have, we struggle to, to explain things, don't we? In our own way, we do the same thing. We come up with everything I know about God tells me it should be this way, but it's this way. Something's wrong. And Job was so insistent that he hadn't done anything that he almost came to the point where, God, I really don't know about you. I'm, I'm walking in everything I've ever heard, and I've, I've tried to... I, I've tried to uh, you know, to serve you the best I know, and I just don't get this. Is there something about you I don't know? And, uh, you know, I see the Lord's goodness and mercy in, in, a, in that whole story. I, I, I guess everybody does. It's, it's kind of obvious. But, but here is Job who had a degree of knowledge about God. The devil has given permission to put him in a horrible terrible trial where nothing seems to work, nothing makes any sense at all, what is he going to do? And all he can do is just, just try to wrestle with it like David did. I'm wrestling with what's happening. I don't understand it. And so he comes to the point almost where he's beginning in his mind a little bit. I just don't know if God's really treating me right. But you know, there's an there's a interesting little comment he made that gives me a clue of what God was trying to accomplish in this. He said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. Do you catch from that a little bit of what was behind his serving God? He had, he had such a vivid appreciation, if you will, for the flood and what God had done to punish the wicked that, man, he wasn't going anywhere near doing wrong. <laughs> If my, if my family's having a party, I'm going to offer a sacrifice. Maybe they sin. You know, this is fearful. I, I just see God as this awesome being, and if he's ready to strike me down if I don't do right. Is that the kind of service that God desires from us? 
No, it isn't at all. And I believe with all my heart that God wanted Job to come into a deeper place of knowledge of him and his goodness and his mercy. And so at the end, I believe Job, Job came into a much better place. We know he does. That's what the Scripture says. When God turned this all around and met him and, and expressed to him the, his great, the greatness of his understanding, God's saying, i got something that I'm trying to accomplish here. I know you don't understand it, but I do. I've got this. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know why I'm doing it. And so Job not only met the Lord in a deep way, he came to a place where he was blessed more than he was in the beginning. It isn't that God wants to withhold blessings, even earthly ones. But God is most concerned with, with uh, you know, my, my faith, my relationship to him. That's the thing. It's not about this world. It's about the one to come. It's about what he's doing. That everything about me, everything I see, is, is going to be gone. Everything that is real, that he has put in here, that's what will live on. And I'll tell you, I need, I need something beyond you know, what I have in my own understanding. I, he, he needs to take me deeper. Anybody here needs to be taken deeper? Yeah, do we want to go to a higher place? Folks, this is the way. A lot of people will say, come down and get an experience, and you will instantly be elevated to another place, and then you will just go as a sailing to heaven in the glory and the, uh, the euphoria of this relationship. Well, I thank God that he can, he can do those kinds of things when it's appropriate. But I'll tell you, the things that deepen us in the Lord are, are like David experienced right here. When he pulls back everything and he allows us to experience this sense of where is God, everything has gone to hell in a handbasket, and I can't seem to reach him, and he doesn't feel like he cares. I'll tell you, we're going to discover things about ourselves in those times. You know, I talked about how Satan would sow seeds of bitterness. Why is, why, why is it this way? Why is somebody else being blessed and I am not? So you see these negative feelings, this, this accusing God of, of, of not treating us right, or being jealous of somebody else or, or, or just you know, all kinds of negative things can come into your heart and into your life that just amount to rebellion, really, and unbelief if we really step back and take a look at it. And I'll tell you, the devil is going to be faithful. I know that many here can testify. You've been in dark places. And how did it cause you to look at God? How did it cause you to look at yourself? Did it affect how you looked at things? Yeah, sure it does. He's going to take you down a dark place of depression if you let him. You'll just, or, or he'll take you to a place of unbelief. Maybe I don't even know God. If I knew God, it, you know, if everything was right, according to my, my concept of things, it wouldn't be like this. I wouldn't feel like this. And yet, every saint of God in the Scriptures, went through dark times like that. How do you think Jesus felt when he went into the wilderness? Do you think he went out there to have a euphoric time of alone time with God? Scripture says he went out there to be tempted by the devil and everything. I guess he drank water, but that was it. He was there with the wild beasts and the devil. And the devil did everything possible to to cause him to question, to bring him down, to bring him, cause him to be separated and to attack his faith. Do you think Jesus had emotions? Do you think he felt like his father was close? I mean, we know on the cross he said, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is part of serving God, is having times when we feel alone and forsaken. We feel alone and forsaken. That's the thing. I'll tell you, I want to I, I want to have something, and I, I want to be brought to the place where I can be like that, the third man who was praying, where it doesn't matter what happens. If God wants me to go through a time like that, it's not going to change one iota what I do or how I feel about God. You think that's what God wants from every one of us? I'll tell you, there's going to be times. You think about Joseph in the Scriptures. All the promises that he had. And everything from that point on went south, didn't it? 
Did he have reason to feel like God's promises have failed? God has abandoned me. He has allowed my own brothers to sell me as a slave into Egypt. And there I just did the best I could. And my reward was to be lied about and thrown into prison where they put me in irons. Now, Job didn't exactly have anything but, Job, uh, Joseph, didn't have anything but faith to go on, did he? And I'll tell you what a lesson there is for you and for me in the fact that he did not change what he did or how he did it. He continued to just put one foot in front of another and continue to maintain his integrity, his honor. But here was a, one of the main characters in the Old Testament story about how God began to build his people and get them ready to be a nation. And God put him through hell as far as the earthly circumstances were concerned. Do you think God had a purpose in it? You know, if you're in the middle of that, you're thinking, what in the world is going on? Why am I, what kind of a fool am I to put my faith, you know, in, in God and then this happens? How many of you know that a lot of the atheists who are really militant atheists in the world are atheists because they went through something? And instead of humbling themselves, they immediately attack the very idea of God. If, if there was a God, he wouldn't have let something like that. Or if there is a God, he's evil. But I'll tell you, we're not going to absolutely, we're not going to come into the kingdom of God without having a faith that's tried. We're going to have to stand when nothing else makes sense. Certainly we gave the example last week of Abraham. And we read the story of Abraham like it's just a few pages. It's just all strung together, and it's, it just flows and makes sense. But how many years were there? How many years were there when nothing was happening? He wasn't hearing visions, and, and God wasn't coming to him in any manifest way. He was just putting one foot in front of another, and nothing was happening. And the Scripture even tells us as we mentioned so often. It was against hope that he hoped, that he believed. He continued to stand fast. That's what God is looking for from every one of us. But I'll tell you, if you're in that kind of a place today, uh, you, you better be thankful to God. God is bringing you to a deeper place. There's so many thoughts I've had, and I'm just praying the Lord will put them in order. One of these days, he's going to let me write an outline again, but I don't have one this morning. But as I say, one of the things that we do that happens to us when we go through something like that is we will learn things about ourselves that we won't learn any other way. When we don't have the crutches, the emotional crutches that we are used to depending upon, the physical crutches, the money in the bank, it could, whatever it is, the relationships. When, we don't, when those aren't the way we like them, and our, our life doesn't feel like, oh, this is great, I'm happy. What a silly word happiness is, or happy is, but anyway, it means my circumstances are pleasant to me. The world doesn't promise anything, any such thing. You can pursue happiness all you want. If that's what you want, you're going to be chasing the, rain, the pot at the end of the rainbow. But anyway, praise God, where was I going with that? Somebody help me get back on track here. <laughs> but we're talking about learning things about ourselves. When the things that we depend upon emotionally are suddenly stripped from us, and then what do we do? Do we react with the bitterness? Do we react with the question? Do we react with depression? Oh, poor me. Everybody's dumping on me. Nobody cares. There's so many ways that if we're going to have to resist that and realize where that's coming from. But I thought about one scripture that I've, we've referred to, and I, don't, I, I guess I will turn over there. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I use this a lot, but it's, it fits here in a special way. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, because Paul is writing about something that he experienced. And he talks about being, in, in verse 8 and 9, somewhere along in there, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. So does that sound like he was in a place where faith was all he had? Yeah, pretty much. That's a pretty good description. 
of where Paul was at. Now, how did he come to be in that? Was God taking a nap? No. God allowed him to go through that. God put him in a place where that would be the case. What did Paul discover about himself in that experience? Yeah, what did he, what did he, he says, indeed, our hearts, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but God who raises the dead. When faith is all we have and nothing else works, we learn something. Hey, the reason I feel distress in this circumstance is because there's something in me that I just, I don't like this. I, I, my nature is to trust in this. You have put me in a place where I'm used to figuring things out. I'm used to using my abilities to handle situations, and that doesn't work. You have stripped me from that. So what do I do with that? Do I recognize, hey, God is doing me a favor. He's taking me in a dark place, but in that place, I'm learning something about me that my nature wants to trust in me. Guess what happens when there is any part of our walk in this world in which we are trusting in ourselves? Well, failure, yeah. But trusting in ourselves is very closely linked to our nature, which is self-seeking, which is prideful. If I'm successful in handling my stuff, then I, I feel pretty good about it. I, I, feel, I begin to, to feel like my success is what commends me to God. You see, all these things come into play. And God is putting his finger on that by allowing us to be stripped of that sense that I've got this, I've got a handle on this. And so God is doing us a favor, and Paul was wise enough in the Lord to recognize what was really going on. Of course, I know many of you, uh, you know, have probably thought about the, the thing that David went through. I mean, what, the last great trial he went through before he gained, began to gain the throne, about the time Saul died, finally, the, the king that was opposing him, you remember what happened? Things were so bad that he had to go live with the Philistines, and he had been a warrior against the Philistines, and now he's got to go over, and that's, he's safer there than he is in Israel. And a bunch of people are living with him in a city called Ziklag, and war breaks out. And instead of going over and helping the Israelites, he, go, he goes to war with the Philistines against Israel. Except that four of the five rulers of the Philistines say, wait a minute, don't you realize who this is? We're not going to war with him. If the battle goes the wrong way, he's going to switch sides and we're going to be in trouble. Now, all you, you ladies won't understand this, but you got a bunch of guys all geared up to go to war. And then you say, oh, by the way, go home. We don't need you. That doesn't work very well. They will be greatly distressed. They will got, they've gotten their testosterone all geared up for, for battle, and all of a sudden they've got to kind of back off. That alone is a, is a cause of a great deal of stress. How many guys say amen? Thank you. Yeah, that's just, that's just part of human nature, part of being a guy. And so now the, the Philistine commander says, I, I trust you, but they won't, so go home. And the journey home was not a little walk in the park. This was like three days, and when they got there, they were exhausted, of course. They were, they were really, I mean, the, the stress and the buildup of all the emotions was such that now they're really let down. And what do they find when they get there? Everything is gone. Their, their whole city has been burned to the ground. Their wives and possessions are gone. And the first thing they did was to weep until what? They had no more power to weep. You ever been there? Yeah, you know there's a time when emotions want to pour out, but we can become so weary even in that that we run out of gas. Well, that's where they got. I mean, they were at the bottom of the bottom. And so what did the men do? David, we're with you. No, they were talking about stoning him. That's not just 
paddling him. That's stoning the man to death. That's what they were talking about. Do you think David was in a low place? The Lord took every natural crutch away from his servant. But what did David do? He encouraged himself in the Lord. You see what faith does, what, where God wants to bring us to that place where when he strips everything, then we have to make choices. David made the choice to trust God and to say, Lord, you, and effectively to say, Lord, you have allowed these circumstances. What do you want us to do? And the Lord took that little exercise of faith. I'm sure he didn't have any emotions to go with this. This wasn't where he went out and God dumped a bucket of honey in his soul and the strength of that. He said, let's go. He was, he had no emotions. How many of you know what, what it's like to be in that place, to make that choice when you have nothing naturally to go on? Yeah, I know what it's like. And I've seen God hear and answer. I'll tell you what. God is going to take you, if you ever amount to anything in the Lord, God is going to take you through places like that. Don't you listen to this kind of fairy tale Christianity where nothing bad ever happens. It will. And God is going to bring us through if we'll, just, if we'll put our trust in Him. If faith, if faith is all you've got, you've got all you need. That's what it comes down to. Do you know, we, we learn things about God. It's not just that we learn things about ourselves. Don't we learn things about God? How many of you have gone through one of those dark nights of the soul when you come out the other end? You, you have a deeper appreciation for God who brought you through that, and you learn things about Him that you didn't know before. Or maybe you knew them up here, but you didn't know them here. You'd heard about stuff like Job did, but you get to the other side and said, now I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Now I get it. Now I understand. Do you think God is about relationship? Sure he is. God is not just about correct theology. I mean, you know, truth is, is, is part of it. But truth that we don't walk in, that we don't, that we don't get, what, what is that about? God wants us to learn about him. And, of course, we learn about the enemy too, don't we? We recognize how he works in different circumstances. And God will bring you through that so that you can talk to somebody else and say, talk to somebody else and say, I've been where you're at. You stand. That's what you need to do. You know, I thought about something. I, there's so many other things that obviously could be said. None of this is new to us. But for some reason, the Lord wanted this this morning. And the songs we sang kind of confirmed it. You know, if I'd wanted to argue with the Lord, I'd, you know, I had to really go against something because the songs, you know, praise him. When you're up against a struggle, I mean, Lord, Lord picked those songs. How about uh, Colossians 1 as a scripture that's come to me, there's some principles involved in what Paul was praying for the believers there. Now, this is a place Paul had never been. He'd heard about a, a group of people that had come to the Lord under, the, under a ministry that God had sent to them, and so he's writing to encourage them. And he talks about having learned of their faith, and verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. The word growing there reminds us of the fact that Everybody who's ever been born into the kingdom of God is effectively born as a baby, right? Spiritually, there's that correspondence to what happens in the natural. And what, is, what does the word say? You as, as spiritual babies desire the sincere milk of the word. Why? That you may grow thereby. In other words, there's a life here that God has placed within us that needs to grow up. Most of us don't want to grow up. We want, to, we want to lie in a, in a warm, soft place and feel the loving arms around us and just bask in that and just be able to live our lives and not worry about anything as though that's what it's all about. God wants sons and daughters who grow up to be mature in Him. And that's what, and, and what, he, what he says here, what he's praying for is, is the heart of it. It's 
knowledge. It's wisdom. And it's understanding. And folks, we need all of those. Now, knowledge asks or answers the question of what? What is true? What do I believe? What can I stand on? Because we're talking about, again, placing your entire trust, your weight, as it were, upon something. Now, how many of you found out you can't trust in anything in this world? I mean, that's not where your ultimate trust is. If, you're, if your heart is so entwined in something, God's going to fix it to where that, that's not going to hold you up. I mean, the house, like Jesus said, the house may look good until the storm comes. And then it's not going to last. So I'll tell you, part of that knowledge is that we need to know what is true. And God has a way of bringing us to a place where we can look into the Word. We can, we can, we're going to have to decide. Am I going to believe what God says or am I not? So what is true? Does the absence of the sense of God's presence mean that he is gone? How do we know that? The word tells us, our experience as we go along tells us that his word remains true. The truthfulness of God's word never varies. It never ebbs and flows with, the, with our circumstances and our feelings. It never changes. There is an anchor, as we've said recently, for the soul. God's word never changes. I mean, if you remember the story Brother Thomas used to tell about the Jewish couple that came to the Lord, and they, they're out, they're for several, three, four days, they were just in eu euphoria. I mean, it was just, oh, it was so wonderful, so new, so to feel forgiven and loved, and all of a sudden they woke up one day and there were no feelings. And I think the wife said something like, was it all a lie? What's going on? I don't get it. And so he opens the Bible and says, it still says the same thing. I mean, it's so simple. But how, how much of a challenge is not that, is that sometimes? Yeah, it's a real choice that we're going to have to make when this does not seem to be true, and yet there it is in black and white, God's Word does not change. When he says he will be with us to the end of the age, does that not mean he will be with us to the end of the age? It doesn't say, I'll be with you when you feel it. So you see, we're going to have to lay hold. There, there's knowledge there. The, the more our convictions are based upon what God has said, the sturdier, the steadier we're going to be when those times when faith is all we have, it's going to be less and less of an issue, less and less of a problem. So we might just be that person that Jesus can walk right on by because he knows. They're steady in the boat. They know. They're not going by all these little winds of change that come through. And the fact, does, does the, my lack of feeling God's presence, does, is he mad at me? Has he stopped loving me? Is that how I know that he loves me is because he, I get these warm, gooey feelings in my soul? Is that, is that how I know God loves me? Have my emotions, do my emotions control what he does or do they reflect what he does? Does that somehow change the cross? I can look at something objective in history and say, I know, devil, I know God loves me. He sent his son to the cross to take care of, to, to erase my guilt before a holy God, to open heaven's door for me. Praise God. Devil, I will not listen to you. You think there's something happening when we are brought to that place where we lean upon the things that we know to be true because God has said it and God cannot lie? Same things we said last week, I guess. I'll tell you, God wants us to, wants to increase our knowledge and we're going to learn things about God. But I'll tell you, in the meantime, when, when the sun is shining, we need to be saying, hey, I need to get this. I need to receive it into my soul. When I hear something, God's going to give me a test on that. There's going to be homework. There's going to be exams. God wants me to have this not just here. He wants me to know it. We do not need secondhand faith in this place or in any place. God wants you and you and you to know him in your everyday life. And I'll tell you, what is true remains true regardless of the place that we're at in our journey.
And so I'll tell you, we need that knowledge. So we need to increase. That's what Paul was, the burden that he had. He said, I, know, I want you to be effective Christians, but this stuff you've got to know. Because if all you think you know is what Satan has put in here, the lies that this world tells, you're going to have a hard time with the Christian life. But I'll tell you, the more we get this, the, more, the steadier we're going to be in the boat. But he doesn't leave it with just knowledge. There's a lot of people, that that's all they want. They want knowledge. They just want the doctrines. They want to get their doctrines right. Their knowledge is right. It goes beyond that. What's the next thing he wants? Wisdom. Wisdom ask, answers the question, how? Knowledge is what? What do I know? What do I believe? What can I stand on? Wisdom says, how, do I, how does this play out in my life? How do I apply what I know to how I live and what happens to me in my life? We need God. You see, Job's friends didn't, had some knowledge that had been handed down to them. They didn't have any wisdom to understand what was going on. I tell you, we need God to, to help us to understand. And there are going to be times... Guaranteed, there are going to be times when we will be in the place David was, when we'll be looking for those answers, and they won't be there, at least not for a while. When God's done the work that he intended to do through those circumstances, don't worry. He'll come on the scene. He'll help us. But I tell you, you and I need to know how to apply the wisdom that we know. You could know, for example, that God wants us to live a holy life. And then you could take that and say, okay, so I've got to be holy. I've got to, you know, and start making rules. Who's, whose wisdom is that? It's not based on truth to start for starters. But I'll tell you, I need wisdom to know how to apply the things that God shows me that are true. I need to know how they affect everyday life because our Christian life is not just what we do in here. It's how I live out here. And I'll tell you, you know, this is one of the things that came to me is, how are you when nobody is watching? That's kind of how we really are, isn't it? We have a way of portraying ourselves to others and even to ourselves. But I'll tell you, what we, the wisdom and the knowledge by which we walk is, is carried out. It's, ex, it's expressed when nobody is looking. When you're a thousand miles away and nobody knows you, how do you live? What do you do? God wants us to be the same as we are when we're in here out there. And he wants to bring us into line with his heart. It's not just his teachings and his religion. My God, we don't need that. But he wants to bring us into line with his heart. And his heart would tell you and me things that are true. They're not always things we want to hear. Sometimes they're the truth about us. We don't want to hear them. And I'll tell you, I would rather hear an uncomfortable truth than a pleasant lie. And line my wit, the wisdom that governs what I do with the truth, I don't care how much it hurts. I know God loves me. I know that's a fact that remains. I can lean on that. I know he's with me. I know he's for me. And so wisdom, where, the, where knowledge answers the question what, wisdom answers the question how. What is understanding? That answers the question why. God wants us to come to a place where we begin to understand the whys. We can get a sense of where God is going with this, and so we can start to say, oh, I get it. I was leaning on the arm of flesh and God saw me in a weakened place, in a place where I was vulnerable to the, to the devil working through me, to building up pride, whatever, whatever the issue is. He saw me in that place and he engineered a place in my journey that was going to deal with that. And I know why he did it, because he wants me to be like him. And he's going to do what it takes. He's going to be faithful even when I'm not. He's going to do things that I will, will not understand at the time, but I'll tell you, he wants to bring me just to a, to a place of understanding. As David said, he doesn't want me to be like a horse or a mule. How many of you are like that? God's got to whop you upside the head to, to make you do something. And so all you're concerned with is, what do you want me to do? Just tell me. God doesn't want that kind of 
relationship with us. He wants us to understand his heart. He wants us to be on board with what he wants. So we need knowledge. We need the wisdom to know how to apply that to our lives. And we need the understanding of where God's heart would take us. And I'll tell you, there's, there's a, I, I don't know what else needs to be said. There's so many thoughts I've had that you could bring into this, and I don't want to just drag it out. But how many of you believe that this is something that's real? When faith is all you have. How many think that's a bad thing? That's a, that's a wonderful thing, even when it doesn't feel like it. Even when circumstances are, are at the bottom. And you think, how, how could they get any worse? I mean, how could they get any worse for the Hebrew, three Hebrew children? Standing there with a roaring fire over there and a king who says, bow or burn. Choices to be made. <laughs> what am I going to do? And yet they stood in the middle. I'm sure they didn't have any euphoric emotions at the time. You think they did? Man, I just feel the power. Oh, boy. I'll tell you, the kinds of choices that the heroes of faith, as we call them that, it's really, the, really God's work in, in somebody's heart that's manifest, manifests his heart. He's the hero. When we read about the heroes of faith, I'll guarantee the choices they made that made the earth-shaking difference in their lives and the lives of many others were not made in the heat of euphoric emotion. See, that's, another, that's a mistake that we make when we talk about faith. Faith almost becomes a thing in itself. And we're going to try to put faith under a microscope. Do I have it? Don't I have it? How sorry? You know, if I had it, how would I feel? What about my faith? You know. Faith is not the object. It's the object of the faith we need to be concerned about. Faith is simply putting confidence in Him. It isn't putting confidence in our confidence. But we do that. We, you know, we, we tend to get very introspective when things aren't going the way we think they ought to go. Oh, I'm going to look inside. What's wrong? How do, I, how do I fix it? How do I understand this? How do I wrap my brain around what's going on, what I'm feeling right now? Oh, I know I'm supposed to have faith. Okay. Try to work up emotion to go with it and figure, okay, now I got it. I feel a certain thing. I'll tell you, faith is a, starts as a choice. But faith is not focused on the faith. It's focused on the object of the faith. We serve a God, like we said, who cannot lie. His purpose is fixed. His word is true. And so the choice become, becomes, am I going to believe these circumstances or am I going to believe that kind of a God? And I am going to make a raw choice to believe in Him. I may be falling into the trap of, okay, I know I'm supposed to praise God. We just sang a song about it. Okay, I'm supposed to praise God. And you were in that kind of a place where your emotions were dead, and you went through, you said, praise God, praise God. I don't feel anything. Why were you doing that in the first place? To feel better. How many people go to church so they'll feel better? You know, who are we focusing on when we're thinking that way? We're focusing on us. I want to feel better. I want to feel good about myself. God, give me that pat on the back so I'll feel good. When God wants us just to cast ourselves upon him and to bless him, he will come when, he, when it's right for him to come. There's nothing in the world that would please him better than to bring us to a place where he can just dump all the buckets of honey in our soul that we could possibly imagine. Don't you know it'll be like that one day when all of this old nature is gone? Do you think there's going to be any barrier? Do you think he's going to withhold himself then? No, it's only the process of getting us there, though, has to wean us away from every earthly trust, everything we lean upon here and find strength and comfort that is not, if not eternal. You know, what's interesting, I was thinking about that scripture that, we, that I referred to about we walk by faith and not by sight. How many of you know where that's found, know what the context is? Well, that's not the one I was thinking of. By faith and by sight is 2 Corinthians 5. If you want to look it up sometime. But you, you remember that there are no chapter and verse divisions in the original. Right? You back up a few verses, what do you have? You have the scripture we use all the time about how we have all these things that are perishing in us, but the inner man is being made strong while we do what? 
We are fixing our eyes on what is unseen because that's what's eternal. Everything we can see, you know, the scripture we use so many times. That's the context that sets up what he says later about we walk by faith and not by sight. I do not, I do not go by how I feel or how things look. If he had, what would they have done when they were out up in the Philippian jail? Call a lawyer. They had, actually, they had grounds to do that. That might be appropriate sometime. I don't know. But, but in this case, he was a Roman citizen. They'd beaten him without a trial. He had every right to, to call a lawyer, to, to really, you know, say something's wrong here, instead of saying, praise God. And so they had, a, they had a prayer and praise session in the prison, and God shook it, and God wound up saving people and doing some wonderful things that were recorded in his word. I'll tell you, God wants to take every single one of us to a, to a higher place. Joseph was put through places where faith was all he had. What was, God, what was in God's heart for him? Bring him to a throne? Do you think his character would have been formed in such a way that he could have occupied that place of authority and forgiveness of his brothers if God had not put him through all that? Do you think David would have been the king that he was without going through all this process of having to trust God when it didn't look like it made any sense? Abraham, everybody, Jesus, who learned obedience by the things that he suffered, who was tempted in every point like as we are. So I just pray that if you're in that place or when you're in that place, we, we have every reason, instead of examining the circumstances, examining our feelings, to lift up our eyes and say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I praise you. I want to offer the sacrifice of praise. It means I have to die to do it. It's a sacrifice for me to say thank you, to praise you, to acknowledge that you are true. And I'm not going to do it and sit here and just, okay, I've done it for three minutes and I don't feel anything. I'm not focused on how I feel about it. I'm just focused on his truthfulness and the fact that I'm trusting him. And I know that right now, he is there. He's there because he promised. I don't care if I feel him, if I ever feel him. I know he's there. I know he's real. I'm going to lean upon that with every, every bit of my being, every fiber of my being is going to lean on him right now. That's when God does the work that gets us to the place where we can be worth something to him in the kingdom of God in this world. If you're one that's got to have where the Jesus has got to lean on, down over you and put his arm around you and whisper in your ear and just constantly feed, you know, give you feedback, he's not going to be able to use you very much, is he? But I'll tell you, when we become faithful in little, he will entrust more to us. Faithfulness in little means, among other things, it means doing what's right. It means trusting God when faith is all we have. And I'll tell you, there's a God who looks at that and says, that's building character in my child. Here's somebody that I can put something in their hands to do and they'll handle it because they're looking to me and not themselves. I'll tell you, we have a God who is faithful. If you're in that place today or if you, if you find yourself in that place in the future, and you will if you're serving God, your emotions will not always support you. But there is a God who has promised never to leave you, never to forsake you. And so we have the privilege of standing upon something that cannot change, that his word is true. And he will bring us through every valley like that. Even when faith is all we have, we'll find out it's all we need because he is faithful. The object of that faith is faithful. To him be the glory. Praise God.